Good afternoon. Sorry for the delay. A little technical difficulties. My hospital laptop wanted everything encrypted, and that obviously does not coordinate well with these Macs. So thank you for your patience. I really appreciate it. My name is Tiffany. I'm a pharmacist at Penn Bay Medical Center in Rockport. I specialize in oncology, so my primary patient, patient population is cancer, adult cancer patients. I'm going to talk to you today about medical cannabis in the setting of palliative care. I do not have any disclosures. There we go. Um, but I do want to say I don't have any vested interest in any of the dispensaries that are in the area. I have no vested interest in the product. It's just something that is becoming so much more common in our practice that I feel like we don't have a lot of information about, and our patients are using it extensively. So we should probably find a way to keep an open dialogue with them so we can help work them through um, this treatment option. All right, this is not working out well for me today. By the end of this lecture, um, or be, by the end of this discussion, I would like for you to understand that we have an endogenous cannabinoid system in our body, and that it is influenced by our endogenous cannabinoids, but also by the exogenous ones that we um, administer in the form of what we know best as THC and CBD, although there are dozens of different ones. They're just ones we know the best about, the most about. There are also challenges to prescribing cannabis therapy um, or guiding our parent patients through using this therapy because there's not a lot of good clinical trial data out there. So how do we do that? And then um, how do we help them manage any kind of side effects that they may exceed by using this product? So our endocannabinoid system is dispersed widely through our body, just like our serotonergic system, our dopaminergic system. It's highly integrated into our hormonal regulation, into our ability to make memories. Um, it's integrated with our ability to um, modify our mood. It's um, involved with our ability to have movement. So it is everywhere. It is any, every place in our body is going to be impacted by this endocannabinoid um, system. So we may be administering a medication that we hope is going to help with appetite stimulation for our patient, but it's important to know that they may get some anxiety from taking that medication, or they may be really sleepy, or they might end up with issues um, involving their movement, or it might impact some of their laboratory values. It also can interact with t dozens, probably hundreds of other medications that patients are on. So we might see maybe not a direct impact from the cannabis itself causing problems, but from increased drug concentrations of other medicines that people are taking. So um, its effects in our uh, different areas of our body are going to be, the biggest ones are probably going to be memory and learning, appetite, metabolism, stress response, social behavior and anxiety, the autonomic nervous system, sleep, and surprisingly, the immune system. That one caught me off guard when I was doing my research. They found their cannabinoid receptors on our immune cells, and when they're stimulated, it actually can downregulate our immune system, which is how they think that it has some impact on our autoimmune disorders and our, our inflammatory disorders. So we can give it for one thing, but just know just because it's a natural plant-derived product doesn't mean it's only going to do the one good thing that we want and have no side effects because it's natural. It's going to hit so many different other areas as well. Yes? Uh, is that just THC or just CBD also? CBD uh, also. Okay. okay. Yep. So because it hits so many areas in our body, we need to treat this like we do every other medication that we're administering to patients or that we're prescribing for patients. The challenge with that is, as clinicians, our bread and butter is going to be randomized clinical trials. There's not a lot of those with cannabis products, and there are multiple reasons for that. One, even though most states in the country have legalized it for medical and or recreational use, the DEA still has it listed as a Schedule One substance. So that makes it really hard to perform clinical trials. There are more hoops. There are more things that you have to go through in order to do it. Also, because this is a natural plant-derived product and it's not synthesized in a lab, every law or batch that's produced is going to be different. So it's hard to get consistent results across the board if you're going to have patients on a trial for an extended period of time or to extrapolate information from one patient population to another if you use a different law or batch because the chemical composition will be different. The amount of THC might be different. CBD might be different. It's not regulated by the FDA, so you don't have that guaranteed 10% um, you know, threshold of everything that comes out is going to be within 10% of the traditional branded product. So it makes it very difficult for us to perform any kind of trials. That chemical composition can be modified um, in the genetic process. They can be genetically modified plants. Um, but it also can be how they grow it, how they harvest it, how they dry it, and in some cases how they're extracting um, the products that they want, the CBD or the THC, for concentrated oils that can all manipulate the percent of the cannabinoids that are in here and thus the effect it's going to have on our body. 
So um, there are also various routes of administration, and each route of administration is going to impact your body a little bit differently and might impair, impact how we choose or how we help guide our patient into what kind of product that they want to use. So probably the most common um, routes of administration that people are going to have are inhalation, oral ingestion, and topical application. Topical is going to be more for like a localized pain, like an arthritis. You will still get some systemic absorption, but it's going to stay mostly localized. With an inhaled product, your onset of action is very fast. It's going to be within one or two minutes. It's peak effect within five or six minutes, and then it's going to start to wear off. So this is great for patients who have a symptom onset that is really fast that they need relief very quickly for. Um, the drawback to this would be you don't want to use it in a patient who could potentially um, not hold their breath for long enough or get a deep enough breath to get the full amount of the medication that they need in order to have the benefit. Oral ingestion, there's tablets and capsules. There's a whole slew of edibles. There's These are just to name a few, candies, cookies, brownies, and gummies. But if you ever go into a dispensary, there is a slew of different products available. And they are not in unit of use doses either. So you might purchase a cookie or a brownie that say is 100 milligrams of THC. And the patient has to know how big of a piece of that brownie to cut in order to get the expected dose that they want from that. So if you have a patient who might not be able to um, do that, um, that might not be a good option for them. The oils um, can come in bottles with droppers. So if you have a patient who has dexterity issues or that has a lot of tremors, that might not be a good option for them as far as um, measuring out what they need. Same thing with the concentrates. Infused beverages are not as common here, but they are more common on the West Coast and they're very common in Europe. So this is mostly gonna be teas and beers that are infused with cannabis. The onset for oral ingestion is gonna be um, one to two hours. So it's important for us, and the peak effect for them is going to be four to six hours. So it's really important for us when we're talking to our patients to tell them not to redose themselves quickly if they find that they're not getting the effect that they want. Because a lot of people feel like if they take a cannabis product, they should have immediate relief. But with an oral product, that's not the case. It's going to take some time. So we recommend not redosing within four to six hours because we don't want them overdosing and then feeling really crummy. There's not a lot of data out there to show that um, they can overdose and cause death, like say with opiates or with benzodiazepines. However, they're going to feel terrible. They're going to be vomiting. They're going to be shaking. Some of them get panicked. They get really bad anxiety, and they're just going to have an absolute awful feeling. They're never going to want to try this product again. So it's really important that we recommend if patient needs um, a dose in their system very quick and they need to titrate it quickly, an inhaled product might be a better option for them. But if they want a product that's going to stabilize them a little bit more and last a little bit longer, an oral product might be a better option for them. The individuals who work at the dispensaries, um, the dispensaries that do recreational and medical typically have these sections um, separated so that they can have people that have um, more experience with medical cannabis and helping people manage chronic conditions that can talk them through a good option for them also. They'll talk to them about what they've got going on at home, if there's something that they can offer that can assist them and help them titrate their dose, especially if they're choosing something like an edible that can help them with what size piece or how many gummies do you want in order to get what you need. I also have sublingual and oral mouth sprays here. They do have those available here and there, and those are gonna have really rapid absorption, just like the um, inhaled product, because it is gonna go under your tongue. So it'd be like somebody using a nitro tab or somebody using an um, orally disintegrating tablet. Uh, but we don't have them as widely available as say in Europe, where they actually have a um, pharmaceutically approved product for sublingual administration called Sativex that's not approved here in the US. So the pharmacokinetics are going to differ depending on um, what route you're going to be administering it. And I already touched um, a little bit on the absorption piece and how quickly it kicks in and how we have to keep that in mind when we're educating our patients. Um, it is widely distributed in your body. It is very lipophilic, so it's going to spread throughout your entire body and it's also gonna store in your adipose tissue. So that's why our terminal half-life is actually so long. So the initial half-life is going to be in and out of your system pretty quick, that half of half the amount of drug ingested. Yes. So if you're saying that it's like feel like what's going to happen for our patients who are anorexic? Would that be a, would there be a problem in absorption? So what they or, or contact, I would say that with less fat. Or? Yeah. So they probably won't get as much stored in that adipose tissue, and they probably benefit from a lower dose at least initially because it's not going to have such a large volume of distribution. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, 
So this volume of distribution is really important for the um, area that it's going to be in, especially with that kind of example. But also, um, the, this cannabis product, CBD, THC, they are highly protein bound. So they're going to compete for sites on your proteins in your body for distribution as well. So say your patient's also on phenytoin for seizures, it's a good chance that your phenytoin level is gonna go up because now you're gonna be competing for um, carrier sites on your proteins in your body that are circulating. So it's important to know when we have people that are on highly protein bound drugs, this can potentially interfere with them. The is another really big one. It's also found in placenta and in breast milk, so really important if you have any um, pregnant or nursing mothers to know that it can cross into those fluids. And um, the big thing I wanted to focus on on this slide is actually on the metabolism. This is huge, and I actually, in the back of the pamphlet, I included kind of a cheat sheet for providers on drug interactions for this, because everybody thinks um, cannabis products, THC, CBD, that they are safe, but they interact with so many medications. So as a substrate, THC and CBD, they're gonna use those hepatic enzymes for metabolism. So any other drugs, which is probably 80% of the drugs on the market, use those same enzymes. So they're going to compete for um, metabolism at those sites. So that means the drug concentrations for the drug concentrations for the drugs they're competing with, as well as the THC, are gonna go up because you have one enzyme that can hold five sites and you have one drug that's hitting those five sites, you add another drug in, there's still only five sites. So if you can't touch on that enzyme to metabolize, you're gonna stay in your system longer and you're gonna have prolonged activity, which can be good in some cases, but can be bad in the event of side effects. That goes the same with inhibition of enzymes. So THC and CBD inhibit all of these hepatic enzymes, which is probably 98% of all the drugs on the market. So any drug that is metabolized by these enzymes is going to see an increase in their serum concentration. And a really great study that demonstrated this was the combination of um, Epidiolex, which was approved a few years ago for pediatric seizures. It's um, FDA approved uh, cannabidiol. That was being studied with clobazam to see if the um, addition of both drugs together would have a greater benefit for pediatric patients. And they found that the um, clobazam had a 60, 60% increase in the drug concentrations when given in conjunction with this because it had such competitive metabolism here. So you have the competition for metabolism at the substrate site, but also it's going to inhibit its metabolism so that your drug concentrations are just going to be that much higher. So again, just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe. And that's why I wanted to include that last sheet in your handout. So if you are talking to patients and you've got them on warfarin for a chronic cardiac condition, their warfarin levels are gonna go up, so their anticoagulation team needs to know. That goes with any of the anticoagulants. Your cardiac meds, your epilepsy meds, opiates, benzodiazepines, all of those drug concentrations are going to increase. So it's really important that we keep an open dialogue with our patients to find out if they're using cannabis products, because if they're seeing these extra side effects, we can kind of um, talk to them about adjusting the cannabis dose. If they don't want to do that, we can look at potentially adjusting some of their other medications to keep them safe. So I'm sure you know there are dozens and dozens and dozens of uses. These are just some of the more common ones that patients are using them for. The um, pain use is wide and varied and um, uh, very subjective, just like pain is, but the data on it is actually not really fabulous for pain. And most of the data that is, has been shown to be benefit from pain has been more from um, pain from muscle spasms or pain from like an inflammatory disease. And that all comes from the decrease in the uh, immune system's activity in those areas. Nausea vomiting, appetite stimulation, um, those have mediocre data as well but there is a good amount of data out there for epilepsy and multiple sclerosis. So you will see them used a lot in those patient populations. The big ones I wanted to draw your attention to on this side, and I'm gonna to talk to them, I'll talk about them again later, is PTSD and anxiety. So there's some data to show that patients benefit from it because it can help to calm them down, but there is a lot of evidence to show that it can actually worsen or cause psychiatric illness. So we have to be really careful in our patients who are using it that we're not worsening a condition where they think that they're making it better because they're using a plant-based product instead of a FDA-approved medication. Um, we need to be monitoring to make sure that they're not making that worse. <clears throat> So due to the lack of concrete clinical data, um, lack of those randomized <coughs> clinical trials, it's actually not recommended to use this as a primary treatment, but as an adjunct to currently accepted medical practice, or as a last line if patients um, have tried everything and nothing is working for them. 
if you are to prescribe it, there's a lot to look into. Drug interactions for one, like I just said, looking at their home medication list and seeing which one of these medications are going to be impacted, specifically looking at those narrow therapeutic index drugs, um, but also any of them that um, can cause added harm like opiates and benzodiazepines. Medical history, comorbid conditions. Um, if you have a patient with COPD, an inhaled product probably isn't the best idea for them because they're probably not going to be able to breathe deep enough or hold their breath long enough to get the full benefit from that medication. Um, cannabis has been shown to cause hypotension and tachycardia. So if you have a patient who already struggles with hypotension and tachycardia, this could worsen it. So that might not be a great option for them. And then psychiatric illness, like I said earlier, it can actually induce anxiety in people or it can induce panic. So if people already struggle with that, that might not be a great choice. Dosage form, so um, looking at what might be a good dosage form for them. I discussed that a little bit earlier too when we were talking about the inhaled versus the edible products. And then dosing, there's a lot of information um, on dosing and a lot of non-information on dosing. So there's a lot of studies that will have a range, but because these products are not standardized in their concentrations that are prepared, it's hard to figure out what's gonna be the best range. So most um, sites that you look at or most references are gonna say, start a patient between five and 20 milligrams per dose, but that's a pretty big range. So most of them are saying start with the lowest dose possible and then titrate up from there because you can titrate up per dose. So if you start a patient on five milligrams twice a day and they take five milligrams in the morning and it's not enough for them, they can take 7.5 or 10 milligrams that night. You don't have to wait several days or several weeks. You could do it dose by dose in order to get them to what is comfortable for them that has minimal side effects. And then cost. These are not going to be covered by insurance. So this is an out-of-pocket expense and it's really not all that cheap. So it might be... Um, unobtainable for some patients simply based on that. So dosing, I was just talking about that a little bit. Um, if you were to start a patient off with say five milligrams, which is kind of the lower end of what most of the um, resources are citing, and um, their uh, symptom was relieved, but it wore off before that 12 hour period. You could increase their frequency to be every eight hours. It doesn't have to stay that every 12 hours. So, but if you found that they took five milligrams and it didn't even touch their symptom, on their next dose, bump them up to 7.5 or to 10 milligrams to see if you can at least get the symptom under control temporarily, and then you can figure out how frequently you need to give it to keep them under control. Sometimes can be a little bit more effective than a lot. There actually is a ceiling effect for um, THC and CBD, so you can take so much that when you're taking it beyond it, all you're doing is causing side effects. It's not going to continue to offer benefit. So all they're going to experience is more anxiety or nausea and vomiting. And we see this sometimes in our patients who use it long term and end up with cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome because they continue to take it thinking, I need a greater dose, but then they're actually just making themselves more sick. And then um, it's important to note that tolerance can develop to this. So just like with our opiates and our benzodiazepines, people might need more the more that they're using it. But again, at some point, they're going to reach that ceiling effect. And that ceiling effect will differ from patient to patient. So some side effects that they might not have a problem with would be a euphoric feeling, relaxation, um, sleepiness in some case. Some people are taking this specifically to help them sleep, hunger, and enhance sensory output. A lot of people find that if they're looking for this to help energize them or help with their creative influence. But there are a lot of undesirable side effects as well, and I've touched on a few of these. Um, elevated laboratory values, the cardiac effects of hypotension and heart rate, um, it can also have our, our THC and CBD, THC <laughs> specifically, can have a lot of anticholinergic effects. So you're going to see a whole slowing down of your GI tract, so your patients may end up with constipation or urinary retention, which then can lead to other complications like UTIs. Dry mouth, dry eyes, so just make sure your patients are staying adequately hydrated. Um, but then you also can get nausea and vomiting, which is interesting since a lot of people are using this to help with nausea and vomiting, but that is a potential side effect with this medication. And then there's a whole mess of psychiatric effects. And I left this for last because my next slide is going to focus on serious psychiatric effects. So um, some patients will get anxiety and depression. Some will get fatigue and um, drowsiness. And a lot of people will get mental clouding and memory impairment. So it's really important if patients are going to start taking this that we tell them that, again, just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe. There are a lot of side effects that you're going to experience. And some people may experience one or two of these, some may experience 10, some might experience next to none. So it really is going to be very different from patient to patient. So when do you advise the patient, like from our perspective, which I've often would say, like, wait, three to five days, usually it will go away. 
uh, when the advice created to say, just try this for this, you know, like certain days, then you stop it totally, even though you're not able to tolerate the side effects. What would you advise the patient in terms of if they're experiencing side effects? So a lot of these side effects might go down a little bit, but they're not going to go away for these people. However, there are some different options. If, um, say, they're using a product to help with inflammation, but they are getting far too sleepy from it, they have um, products that you can get that they have um, extracted the chemical components from, and they've made them in different concentrations. So THC seems to be significantly more sedating than CBD does. So you can get some products that maybe they still want a little THC in it, but they can have a lower concentration of it and just have a higher concentration of CBD. So that's what I would do is I, when I have a patient who's interested in starting, I recommend that they start this on a day or a couple of days where they don't have to go anywhere and they don't have to do anything and they can stay at home so they can see the full benefits or effects, I should say, on their own at home. And then they can decide how they want to proceed from there. If they want to get one with a different um, concentration of ingredients or if they want to try a different product entirely. Um, and then the serious side effects um, that it can cause some treatment failure and it can worsen mani uh, mania or cause uh, manic symptoms. And then um, if we're using it in our adolescent population, um, THC and CBD have been known to interfere with our neuronal development. So they have seen um, increased psychiatric illness and decreased intellectual performance in the growing brain. And most um, people, you know, the growing brain is up to what, your mid-20s, 23, 24, somewhere in that ballpark. So. So my recommendations are um, due to the limited clinical trial data um, to continue with kind of the standard of don't recommend this as a first line, but potentially an adjunct to their current therapy. Or if it's a last line, last ditch, that's something they can consider. Um, make sure we're discussing the perceptions and goals. What's, a, what's the patient's goal? What do they want to get out of this? And talk to them about is that something that can potentially be reached with this product? but also knowing that this is going to vary from person to person very significantly. So you can't guarantee that by starting this, it's going to solve that problem, but it's worth maybe a try for them. I also think it's important to keep in touch with the dispensary. And I didn't mention this earlier, even though when I was practicing this in my head the last couple of days, I did. Mm -hmm. um, the dispensaries actually keep a record of what a patient purchases. So if I go in and I um, purchase a product, they keep a record of that. And they also keep the lot number that they got. They send their lots off for chemical analysis. So if I come into my doctor's office a month later and I'm like, I use the same dose and I just can't get out of bed, something is wrong. I could call, my doctor could call a dispensary and say, Tiffany Wagner picked up um, a product on this day and on this day and she's having a lot more sleepiness. You know, was there a difference in the product they got? And they can tell you, yeah, that one actually had 25% more THC in it than the other one. So tell her to drop her dose down a little bit. So they're willing to work with people if we're willing to work with them as well and include them as part of that care team, knowing that they're having a lot of those discussions. Like we were talking about earlier, that sometimes people are more willing to talk to someone other than their doctor. So they're sometimes getting more information than we are, and that can be very beneficial for us when we're guiding their care. And then just making sure we're starting low and going slow so we don't scare them away from the therapy. I know that was a lot of information and it was really fast and I'm sorry. But um, what questions do you have? Yes, Dr. McLaughlin. So, so um, you, a lot of these products are mixed THC, CBD. Yes. Right? So if you have somebody, it sounds like you said, you know, um, THC tends to be maybe a little bit more sedating, maybe you have to go for a pure THC, a back a little bit THC at that time of sleep, or, or, or are they all mixed? Do you recommend? They're not all mixed. So you can get separate products, especially the CBD alone products are becoming much more common because people don't like the, most people don't like the sedating effects of the THC. Yeah. So you can get CBD products on their own as well. And is it true that THC is better for neuropathic pain? Did you come across any of that information at all? Or? So I was finding a little bit of both. So um, that the combination products tend to be better because you're hitting both of the THC and the CBD for neuropathic pain. Um, but that both can be beneficial depending on what you've got going on. Yes. I have no affiliation with this brand. But I'm just going <laughs> to put out there that um, I did recently discover Dr. Sulak has put out a, a healer line of CBD THC combination um, creatures, drops, concentrates. And they ha he, there's a whole panel saying what, what effects they have, what they're used for, they're even labeled, and they say impairing or non impairing on them. So yeah. That I thought was really nice because it's so it's hard to find something that's that clear and that spelled out and that user friendly. So if you're looking for a line that's going to really help you, that I thought that one was really nice. That's great. Thank Healer. you. Yeah. 
Thank Dr. Sula. Um, first, firstly, uh, specifically uh, CBN, which is cannabinol, is also there's some research showing that's effective. And there are products out there. Yeah. What other questions do you have? Oh, <laughs> two more. Up on up. <laughs> I just had a question if there was a, the, the providers in this room are open to THC, CBD. In my experience, there are some doctors unwilling to work with a patient who uses this. Yes. Is there more education opportunities for um, prescribing doctors around this coming up, or has there been in the past few years? I hope so. Yeah. Um, so this presentation is actually a consolidated presentation that Dr. Michalakis and I gave to our local providers a few years ago. Um, and it was a longer presentation, but it was to our local health system. And the goal of that was to help educate them that our patients are using this. If you can keep an open mind to it, then they'll be more likely to open up to you and tell you that they're even using it. So if they think that you're going to judge them or if they think that you have a stigma associated with it, they're not going to open up and talk. So let's just try and break that right now. So that was our goal with that um, presentation. And I'm hoping more places are doing this. And I think because it's becoming more common, I'm seeing, at least when I do med rec with patients, I'm seeing less resistance to them telling me when they're using these products now than five years ago when I was doing med rec. So, yes. Um, some of you will see a banner that says Seed to Health out in the lobby, and it is John Wojtowicz, Miss E, Evan, Mac, back there, and others who are working directly in the field of cannabis, mm -hmm. and psilocybin, and other plant medicines. How do I do? Try and start thinking about whether we can from experiences privately shared, tease out, because it is plant medicine, and it's not going to really fit into the RCP paradigm per se. How do we start to learn together is our expression. Yeah. What's working and what's not. So we're here today to start to reach across, and uh, Sulak is definitely a global superstar, um, but this should come from all of us and all of our experiences. Yes. You know, and I just think, so. you know, as opioids become more challenging to work with, you know, both socially and from a regulatory point of view, and we need something else in our toolkit as healthcare yes. providers. We need yes. Something else, right? And, but it's, and the consumer, the patient, the members, we refer to people on both health and restorative health are choosing this. And so how do we start becoming a team? Yeah. And um, it's so also, this is, I'm, I, thank you for giving oh, this thanks. discussion. Um, it's also um, important for us to try to break that stigma with our patients too, because like you said, more are using it. But like I had one patient who quietly asked me about it a few weeks ago. And then said, never mind, I don't want to use it because I used it in the 70s and it gave me the worst hallucinations. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it's a little different now. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, I think that's, it's really important for us to start because it is becoming so prominent in our practice. Most that, that people probably don't even just, know that their patients are using the it. The other thing is, is that many people, quote unquote, use it recreationally. And as you correctly observe, cannabis doesn't know I'm being used recreationally. And certainly the endocannabinoid system doesn't know. Correct. So you have people arriving for care or treatment who have an endocannabinoid system responding to cannabis for quote unquote recreational reasons, mm -hmm. but everything that you're raising and the elevated impact of, of, of both contraindications and enhanced performance of pharma yeah. is really important for people to be aware of. So yes, thank you. That's why we're reaching out here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I've gone over my time. I'm going to turn it over to Katie. I'm so sorry that I've. Oh, yes. Go ahead. I just, I'm going to set up my, my, my slides. I this question or not, but talking. I have some patients who ask about professional licenses and whether they could lose their professional license, truck driver, nurse, whatever, if they're caught with it in their system. Yeah. I, know it's, I know it's legal. <laughs> You can lose your license. Yeah. There are yes. yeah, there are driver certifications <laughs> that require military <laughs> pilots. And it's unfortunate if you're in if you're in healthcare, you're in healthcare, you're in healthcare and you're working for an organization that's federally funded because it's still illegal federally, you're going to run into some challenges. If you're a driver and you're going across state lines, you're going to run into some challenges. Hi. So. Um, it's a quarter to two, and the next big conference starts at two o'clock. 
Um, my presentation, if I talk really fast, was 30 minutes. So, okay, I just wanted I just wanted to say, if people want to leave at two o'clock, I will not be offended at all. So just leave. I will continue talking till the end and stay <laughs> later. But if you want to leave, leave, and I I, I will not be offended um, whatsoever. So I totally understand. Um, so my name is Katie. I'm a nurse practitioner. I am uh, work at Maine Medical Center and the palliative care team. I've been there for over 11 years, <laughs> off and on. I've also worked in other places around the state and um, with Andrew Scoggin for a little bit and, and other places. But I, um, I started getting interested in the research with psychedelics a few years back with what the promising uh results that they're finding with our patients. And um, so let's see if this works. Okay, no, no, nothing to disclose here. Um, my objectives, it's really funny, I realized when Tiffany had all these objectives, I was like, oh, I probably could have added more, but <laughs> I was trying to limit myself for 30 minutes. But basically, I'm just going to summarize the clinical evidence and applications for psychedelic assisted therapy and palliative care. Um, it's just a pretty much of an overview. I just want to also say I'm not a pharmacist and we're I'm under a pharmacological update. So my presentation will not be as wonderfully <laughs> um, done as Tiffany's in terms of the pharmacology. So I just, let's just start with what we're, what what is psychedelic? What does it mean? And um, the definition, the of literal definition of psychedelic is mind manifesting or mind revealing. Um, psyche, meaning soul or mind, and delos, meaning make visible or manifest um, or reveal. And this this term was coined in 1950 by a psychiatrist named Humphrey Osmond as he was trying to describe his experience after taking mescaline. And um, now we hear um, entheogen a lot is a word that we comes up, um, and especially in the decriminalization folks is trying to, I think, separate themselves a little bit from the, the history of the word psychedelic. But what we're referring to is a group of diverse biologically active compounds. Um, Ethnobotanists ethno have um, identified over 100 different plants, um, mostly in the Western Hemisphere, that are uh, actively uh, psychedelic. And these compounds have been used for these the millennia. I mean, there's 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 evidence that they've been used thousands and thousands of years ago, all over the globe, um, all different civilizations. They've been used for religious rituals and rites, rites of passage, healing ceremonies, both for individually healing and also community healing. And what these these compounds do when they're taken orally, ingested into the body, they create an altered state of consciousness. And this is something that is kind of historically a hard thing to describe, like what this means. So, um, so there's perceptual changes where people will see um, uh, intensification or changes in light or contrast. You can see changes in texture. Um, there'll be a hallucination, you see a ge you know, geometric pattern, or you could actually see like a lion walking in the door. Um, there can be, there's a really profoundly altered sense of time. Uh, there are emotional changes that happen where people can have a really greatly expanded um, affect or ability to feel different emotions and including experiences of kind of awe or bliss or wonder, um, as well as feelings that can um, be pretty overwhelming and destabilizing as well. There can be cogn cognitive changes where um, there's this kind of rigid sense of thinking and can be loosened, and so there's looser associations. Thoughts become more fluid. Um, there can be associations between things that maybe weren't, weren't seen before. And then there can be transpersonal changes, which means that our ego defenses can be lowered so that more emotional or narrative material can come up and become available to work with and to make um, associations between. And that can lead to some pretty novel insights at times for people. Um, sometimes our boundaries, the boundaries can be completely uh, dissolved. And so people can have a feeling of, of ego dissolution or like a mystical type experience where um, they become one, 
you know, with the, with the universe. And I just wanted to take a second to talk about this mystical type experience because I'll be talking about it a lot during this. And what is meant by that is a sense of unity or oneness, a deeply felt positive mood, transcendence of time and space, and a sense of awesomeness or reverence. So that's kind of the definition of mystical type experience. <laughs> So these are the psychedelics that are currently being researched. Um, and I, I kind of, I wrote down next to them, you know, the, the, the disorders or, um, that are being looked at to see if these psychedelics can help with them. This isn't an exhaustive list, like, but it's, it's pretty good. I think about, you know, what's going on right now. There's, as of yesterday, there were 121 clinical research trials happening with psilocybin, um, 145 with LSD, four with ayahuasca, none currently with ibogaine, and 122 with MDMA. So, and these are all schedule one drugs. So, um, like Tiffany was saying, in terms of getting the, <laughs> having the funding and the ability to do research on these is pretty challenging. So it's pretty, I think, impressive numbers that there's this many trials going on right now. So today we're going to talk mostly just about psilocybin because this is the one that is mostly used with our patients. Uh, most of the, it's not, it's, there's also LSD and MDMA are being used, but psilocybin is the primary one. And the reason why is just because, um, well, it would, it's, the FDA designated it a breakthrough therapy in 2018 because of its safety profile and also um, just the overwhelming positive evidence that it's had in terms of how um, it's way better than anything else we have for treating depression and anxiety out there right now. And it has a relatively short duration of action, so about four to six hours. And, um, and it has a high propensity to produce these mystical type experiences and reportedly less anxiety producing than LSD. So why psychedelics? Why are we even talking about this with our patients? I think we all know that when people are, receive a diagnosis of cancer or any kind of life-limiting progressive illness without a cure, they have increased levels of anxiety and depression. Uh, statistically, it's about a third of an increase of anxiety and depression in patients who have cancer. But I think that really we see that it's way more than that. Um, and then there's also this really under-recognized and unnamed demoralization, demoralization syndrome, which I feel like we see all the time and just don't really name it. Um, so this is... Oh, God. <laughs> you. Hi. Oh, it's so sweet, subtle. <laughs> Okay. All right. So it is defined by impaired coping, feeling trapped, hopeless, disheartened. Since we camera. All right. Oh my gosh. Let me just like shake that out a little bit. All right. All right. Um. So. The not so light demoralization, demoralization syndrome. So these are patients that we often, I feel like we often get referred in the hospital to have a consult on death with dignity. Um, they're, they have, you know, often a hastened, you know, a wish for a hastened death, um, significant functional impairment. Like these are things that we see. And then also just incredibly decreased quality of life and the, the impact of this on patients is tremendous, but then also you think about the caregivers, um, their families that see it, and then also us, their medical team, and we really don't have great options for treating this. You know, we have SSRIs, uh, we have anxiolytics, but we have really fallen pretty short in treating this symptom compared to pain, constipation, and nausea, vomiting. Like, there's not a lot that we have to offer these patients. So, all right, so, so, so Tiffany, bear with me. <laughs> what are you doing? All right, so this is, this is my version of how these work. And like I said, I'm not a pharmacist, so this is, this is um, 
going to be a nurse practitioner's version of, of pharmacology. So, um, so psilocybin is a serotonergic psych psychedelic, and so it works. Its effects are mediated by the serotonin receptor activation. And so when these, when these receptors are activated, it, it involves it, memory and learning. Um, there's CNS excitation, which is where you get the psychoactive effects of hallucinations and these mystical states. There's an anti-inflammatory effect that happens. And essentially the theory is that this, um, this cascade of, of events that happens when these receptors are activated, it destabilizes the brain networks, which allows for new ways of connectivity with it to emerge within the brain. So it's been compared to, or like uh, metaphorically said, it's like resetting a computer. So, so you have that happening with the, the serotonin um, activation. And then the other things that we've seen on fMRIs is that, so there's um, a decreased activity in the default mode network. And what the default mode network is, is the part of the brain, um, along with the salience network and the executive network, is where there's this self-referential thinking. So this is where people get caught in these loops of depression, this rumination, this kind of negative thinking. And what psilocybin does is it decreases the activity in the default mode network. And so by doing that, um, when it does that, it also increases activity in other networks that had not pre or other parts of the brain that had not previously been integrated. And so this like picture is like, that's your brain and then that's your brain on drugs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in a good way, not the Friday, not the Friday. Not the Friday. Not the Friday. <laughs> Um, anyway, so, so there's this increased connectivity um, and flexibility and crosstalk between the different parts, of, different parts of the brain. There's also a decreased brain modularity. And, and the way to think of that is kind of like um, in mud season where we have these like big ruts in the road and the mud tracks. And so instead of like, oh, that's the only way our car can go, we're just going to go down that, um, you know, those deep ruts. Um, what psilocybin does is it kind of smooths everything out. So there's, there's all of a sudden you're like, oh, I can go this way, I can go this way. I don't have to go in this path. And so the, the brain has the ability to create new networks and new paths. So there's also this neuroplasticity. So they actually see that neurons can grow in new ways. And so this is, um, you know, it, it, it gives our patients, like when you think about it, with all these things happening, it like sets the groundwork for people to be able to look at their illness, define, like how they're, like their illness and themselves and how um, they relate to each other, how they exist in the world with this and can allow them to have um, new insights and awareness and um, opportunities to live in a different way or experience their illness in a different way. So contemporary research with psychedelics, there's so there's early research, lots of early research um, that happened in the 50s and 60s, mostly with LSD. And this is this is um, I'm not going to talk about it because we just don't have time to talk about it. But but what I'll say is that in the early research, um, there were over 40,000 participants that received psychedelics in this yeah. research. There were over a thousand scientific papers published. There were international conferences on psychedelics. Um, there was a huge amount of research happening in the 50s and 60s. And then the because of our culture and like what happened with Timothy Leary and then drop in, drop out and Nixon and the Vietnam War and the Controlled Substance Act happened in 1970, made all of the psychedelics schedule one drugs and it completely stopped research like overnight. So people were in the middle of research, clinical trials, and had to stop. Um, so in 2000, Johns Hopkins um, was able to obtain a regulatory approval through the, with the United States to be able to, to start up research again with psychedelics. And in 2006, they published a paper that showed that it was safe, and that it was feasible to do this research, and that it was really effective. And so that kind of restarted the psychedelic movement in terms of um, where we are today. So since 2010, there have been three randomized controlled trials 
Um, their study designs basically are double blind. Random, they had randomization, cross over methodology, placebo, and they show they all show there's no adverse effects. They are safe. It's feasible, and they um, showed rapid and sustained symptom reduction. So I'm just going to go through each of them really quickly. So the first one that we're going to talk about is from uh, this is in UCLA, and it was really just a safety and efficacy trial. So this is the first study that was done with patients with cancer. So this is the first study with our patients. Um, the other trials prior to that had been people with treatment-resistant depression and anxiety and different, you know, alcohol use disorder or other things. But but this is the first one since the the research came back um, for our patients. And what they found was that it was safe, that there were the transient elevations in heart rate and blood pressures, but no adverse <coughs> medical events or psychiatric events. Um, they did show immediate improvement in mood that was sustained at two weeks, and they showed a significant reduction in treat, but not state anxiety at one and three months. So there were, there were good results. They used a pretty low dose of psilocybin um, in this trial, and again, it was more of looking at um, really safety and efficacy, trying to get the ball rolling with research again. So this study was done at Johns Hopkins, and they used a much higher dose of psilocybin, and then they used a lower dose of psilocybin to help with blinding, because um, you can imagine blinding is a huge issue in psychedelic research. So, and what they found was also a sustained reduction in depression and anxiety, you know, improvement in quality of life and a high incidence of the mystical type experiences that were connected directly with symptom reduction. So the patients who had uh, miss the higher dose, when they were taking the higher dose of psilocybin and they had mystical type experiences, that was directly correlated to symptom reduction. And what they found was after they, so it's a crossover study, so both, like the patients got both. Um, and after they, after they collapsed across groups and, and looked at the results, the overall clinical response rate at six months was 78% uh, of patients had a decrease in depression and 83% in anxiety. And then the overall symptom remission rate at six months was 65% for depression and 57% for anxiety. So these are like huge results, like really huge. You don't, we do not see this with Lexapro. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, yeah, yeah. And then the one month, um, one month after the high dose session, 78% um, of the patients rated it as one of the five most meaningful experiences of their lives. 83% rated it as one of the five most spiritually significant experiences of their lives. 94% um, had an increased sense of well-being. I just like um, 89% had a positive had positive reported positive behavioral changes. Were these guided sessions or what was the? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I like I know I had to really pick and choose what I put in here. So yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, the that is. Um, uh, psychedelic assisted therapy is what's happening. Yeah, so there's quite a bit of um, preparation and, and pre-sessions, usually three um, sessions for preparation and then the dosing session, and then people will have like, you know, two or three integration sessions afterwards, so. Do you know what the sample size was? For this one, 51. 51, okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, and then the Ross study, this was at NYU, and um, they, you know, it was very similar to the other ones. They found um, symptom reduction persisted at six and a half months with response rates of 60 to 80 percent. And again, it was this high, high correlation of, between mystical type experiences that patients had and improvements on four of six of their primary outcome measures. And this is really interesting. I didn't put in another slide in for this, but there, is, there was a follow-up study for the patients who survived. Like 15 patients were still alive. Um, it was like 3.2 to 4.5 years later after this study. So they went back and re-interviewed the patients that had survived this study. And of those 15 patients, actually one of them died during, during that study. But um, at the end, the, the 14 patients that they had 
showed that 60 to 80 percent of those of those participants continued to meet criteria for clinical antidepressant or anxiolytic response and remission. And 71 to 100 percent of participants attributed the subjective effects of the positive changes to the psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy experience that they had. So challenges with this research is huge. Um, as you can imagine, it's impossible to fully blind for these trials um, for both the participants and the people giving it because you know you get niacin and people are going to have to sit there for six hours, you know, and here. <laughs> I'm like, it's, it's so it's kind of clear to everyone. It's really hard to, to blind for this. Um, there is expectation bias, like it's all in the news everywhere. People are reading about this. They think, you know, I'm going to take this and I'm going to, you know, meet God. And, and so there's like a lot of different things that happen with this that are challenging. There's need for greater diversity. The, um, the research, the randomized control trials that have been done have been pretty much on white, middle-aged, middle-class people. And so there's, and the fact that and again, this is like too much to go into today, but the way that this, this work is done um, and the impact of what psychedelics do to you during the, the session, you, if we're gonna be treating a more culturally diverse, um, ethnically diverse patient population, we really need to um, think about that in terms of how we provide the therapy. And that's a more complicated conversation, but but there is there is this there is a big decrease in terms of the generalizability of this work. But um, it's also poorly understood still these neurobiologic effects. Like what is the what's coming from the medicine versus the interaction with a the therapy team? Because people do get so much attention. Like there's something to be said for somebody just like sitting there and, and staring at you for six hours and like having that kind of like nurturing support for that long. And so it's hard to tell like what exactly is the psilocybin versus the, um, the therapy that people are receiving. So these are the clinical trials that are currently going on that are relevant to palliative care and hospice. Um, these are, there's 10, these are active trials right now. Um, uh, number five is I think really interesting. This is through Care Dimensions. I don't know if any of you guys know Care Dimensions. It's a pretty huge hospice outside of Boston. They're working with Dana Farber, and um, what I think is really interesting about what I'm curious to see what they what happens with it is that they are they have embedded uh, psilocybin therapy in their hospice, so they have they've developed a, a way for the nurses to do the triaging to or um, to get to recruit patients, and then they dose the patients in the hospice house, and then they've trained the clinicians in the community to be able to do the integration work. And so um, I think they've only dosed like two or three patients at this point. So it's pretty early in the trial. It's a 15 patient trial. So, um, but I'm super curious to see what happens because this is the first time it's actually hasn't been done like in a clinical research site like Johns Hopkins or NYU. This is like in the community, like they are, in, they are integrating this into their community. Very cool. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about like the, what's happening outside in the world. And so this is, a lot of you have heard about decriminalization and probably there's people in this audience that know more about it than I do. But I just want to talk about how decriminalization is really about um, like who's going to jail. Like it's like a legal thing. It's like who's getting arrested for this, what are, what's happening. And so this isn't decriminalization, like all these things, these decriminalization that's happening in all these cities you know, is great, but it's not creating the infrastructure on how to provide this treatment for our patients. So it's, it's like a slightly different slant. So I just want to say that. And then I also want to just talk about what's happening in Oregon. Super interesting. So Oregon passed Measure 109 in November of 2020. And what that did was it directed the Oregon Health Authority to license and regulate the psilocybin uh, treatment. And so what they did is they created this advisory board to help guide this um, over, the, over the last two years to create the infrastructure and the plan for how this is going to be rolled out. And they're actually submitting their final regulations next Friday, so October 14th, so we have today. And then, which is like really, you know, soon. Um, and the um, Oregon Health Association is going to, authority is going to be responsible for licensing 
um, these clinics and facilities. And so the applications for licensure open up in January. So in like two and a half months, and they'll be licensing facilitators, service sites, growers and labs. And what's really like fascinating about this is that, so Oregon felt like they didn't want the FDA to be the only one regulating psychedelic services. So they are creating this framework and regulations that are outside of the medical system. So people who don't have a diagnosis and don't have a prescription can still access these treatment facilities. So like you or I could go to Oregon and go and receive psilocybin and buy and, and, and have our experience um, supported by trained facilitators and um, we can go for spiritual development or just like wellness or, you know, treatment of like a mild underlying depression or whatever. We don't have to be, you know, have a prescription for it. So this is this is kind of fascinating because um, they really wanted to look at psilocybin and psychedelics for like wellness overall and prevention rather than just treatment of, you know, uh, more serious diagnoses. So it's all private pay? Well, I, yeah, I think they're trying to figure that out. <laughs> there's some, there's, this is not like, this is not easy. I mean, they were working two years on this or, you know, like, wow. and there is a lot of like things that are popping up that are, that are going to be challenges still. So it'll be interesting to watch and see what happens because they're kind of leading the way, but, um, but I don't think that they're like out of the woods, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think they've got a lot to figure out still. And it's a great idea and model, but we'll see what happens. I just have a quick question. So the people that they went back three and a half years later, mm -hmm. they just got that one little treatment session three years before, and everything's been fine for three and a half years. Like, that's insane. Yeah. <laughs> no dosing in between. <laughs> no, I mean, they didn't report. I mean, probably not. I mean, right? they were in hospice. Like, I don't think so. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, they could have, but I, I think they, I'm sure, I mean, I, I don't have the study with me on me, but, um, but, you know, I'm sure they asked that question. But, like, these are, these are not, the patients that are recruited for these trials are mostly, you know, psychedelic, like, naive, psychedelic naive patients. So these are... Not your run of the mill, you know. These aren't people who are like psychonauts out there doing like tons of things. So it sounds yeah. like it's trying to like rewire your neuronal structure. Like that one dose yeah. is going to just reset your system mm -hmm. from whatever's been screwed up. Yeah, or at least provide like that. Yeah, it is. It's like a reset, and it. Yeah. But it provides like a, like like opportunity to be able to like step back and see things from a different perspective, and then. But then I would, I have to say, it's like, there's like the integration piece is so huge. Like the work afterwards, like there's like the session and then you, and you might have these great insights and your brain is like primed for growth and for like doing the psychotherapy around like what, like what, what is my cancer? How is, what is my relation to the cancer? Like, like what is my relation to death? How do I feel about death? And like, so you're, there's still work to be done afterwards, I think, but it like resets you to a place where you're available to do that work versus like our patients who are just so stuck in anxiety and, and panic. Can you talk a little bit about your um, national work and your certification? Did you mention that at all? Oh, I didn't. I didn't. Um, let me just like skip through really quick because I just like want to say like <laughs> I love Dr. Cha. I love him. I think he's amazing. <laughs> Um, it's really unfortunate what happened in February. Um, so Senator Donna Bailey, she um, she had this, she she sponsored a bill to do this in Maine, to do something similar to Oregon, and it was unfortunately um, voted down. And um, so Dr. Shaw really felt like we needed to wait until the FDA approves psilocybin MT MDMA before we start thinking about it. And so my my... Like, I don't know if we need to do exactly what Oregon is doing. Like, I don't know if that's the right thing. I'm not advocating for that. But I do think that this is coming no matter what. Like, this is going to happen in the next couple of years. And I feel like it's going to be really, like, a pandemonium out there. Like, so I feel like whatever we can do to, like, <laughs> prepare, especially for our patients who are going to have are going to have limited amounts of time, who are going to, like, be so vulnerable. Like, we need, I just feel like our palliative care and hospice like needs to be on this and needs to have a plan in place for our patients and what other people are doing like there's going to be all different like 
there's all different vantage points and interest points and, 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 you know, these like, oh my gosh, substance use disorders. Like there's so much good work that can be done in so many different fields, but, um, but I feel like we can be leaders. I feel like palliative care and hospice can be leaders in this. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just like really quick. I, and I know it's like, it's silly, but the, um, this is really interesting. This is bipartisan um, legislation that's being introduced in the Senate or was introduced in July um, to, to uh, adapt the Right to Try Act so that it would remove the obstacle of these being Schedule One drugs. Right now with Right to Try, as you guys know, um, patients can access um, chemotherapies, experimental drugs through um, that have just gone through the phase one clinical trials, but because of the Controlled Substance Act and these being Schedule One drugs, they do not qualify for right to try. So there, there is this was put forward in July to amend it so that MDMA and psilocybin would be available to our patients. And then also SAMHSA also put forth a letter back in May that they were going to create a task force, a federal task force to oversee the, um, the rolling out of this because of the anticipation that the FDA is going to approve both MDMA and MDMA probably within the next year and then psilocybin within the next two years. So, so there's a federal buy-in to like, oh, maybe we need to think about how we're going to do this in this country because this is like a totally different type of therapy than has ever existed before and it's going to need like a whole different rethinking in terms of insurance coverage and training and facilities and how we do it. So, so anyway, so that's happening. Is there any, are, are any people receiving that therapy here in Maine, even for trial? Like uh, how did you Which one? The, I mean, the psilocybin, like how are you doing it now if it's not? It's not, yeah. it's clinical it's trials only. Clinical trials only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Canada, you get, their patients are getting it through the Right to Try Act in Canada. Okay. Um, and that's, yeah. And uh, technically in Oregon, yeah. I recognize this is maybe like a whole other talk, but how do you think about ketamine fitting into this? Yeah, I purposely left ketamine out. <laughs> because it is a whole different talk. And it's, I, I just feel like in terms of the evidence for our patients is really not there. And um, I know people are using it and I'm on a listserv that's just like, people are like, you know, put, give everybody ketamine, so great. And, and, you know, and so, and I'm not saying that's not true. I just like haven't seen it. And my colleagues, like the, the people I know who are doing this work, like, they haven't seen it like in their practice, like they've tried it and haven't seen like great, like robust response uh, with, with our patients. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, it's a different thing if you talk about treatment resistant depression or bipolar disorder, or, like other things that there, it's being used for, but specifically with hospice and palliative patients. I just goes back to the um, John Hopkins study or anything else. Um, is there any issue with like pre uh, pregnant or nursing people? Um, they, they didn't, no, I mean, they were all had end-stage cancer, so they weren't ah. pregnant or nursing. <laughs> <laughs> they were, yeah, they were, they were pretty sick, so, yeah, yeah. Um, just a quick question. I had a couple patients on hospice ask me about microdosing of psilocybin, mm -hmm. and just what kind of advice, if any, you would give them on that. Or just, yeah, I would say, do it. Like, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that they um, should like be well educated, like on what they're doing, how much they're taking, when they're taking it. Micro doesn't dosing doesn't mean everyday dosing. It doesn't like there's there's ways to do it, and um, and like you know, Tiffany was saying like this, like it's still not benign. Like these, there's like very low side effect profile, but like there's like it's safe these are it's safe in a way that that cannabis isn't i think but it's it, it, people still like run into trouble so it's not like you know nothing and um and and depending on how much you take like if you take a little too much it can be like if you're not prepared it can be super destabilizing so like i just think there needs to be a lot of education around it i think it's like like potentially a really great thing um, but 
Yeah. And the supply is difficult too because you're yeah. it's hard to titrate because yeah. you don't it's not you don't know what you're getting. Isolated psilocybin, right? Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. It's like yeah, you don't know how much is in each mushroom and that like who grows the mushrooms. It's the same thing with cannabis. It's not regulated. So unless you're getting it through a clinical trial where like, you know, it's it's synthetically made and you know exactly what you're getting, um, it's there is a little bit of randomness there. So like again, it's and and there's and it's all underground, so it's really hard to figure that out. Yeah. May I ask just a very quick question and a show of hands of people in Israel, the population of people using cannabis do so in the public health system, and their experiences in the cannabis they are using is quite well regarded and expressed and known. And so people's experiences are pooled. So it's not a randomized trial, it's a real world evidence kind of approach. Would people think that's a good idea in Maine? So, Just, so like, um, I don't understand what you're asking. started to really start getting from real world experience what people's experiences are and start pulling that together, de-identified all of that, but just start learning from our experiences, what's actually happening in our population. I think, I think, that, yeah, it makes sense to pull, like to gather information from what people are experiencing. Absolutely. I mean, we just need I'm, the time. Like in primary care, my patients were very forthcoming about whether or not they were using cannabis. It's how much time do you have to really yeah. have yeah. that conversation? There you go. Yeah. yeah. They do have some studies that were done um, that recruited, you know, they were recruiting for X, Y, or Z reasons, but they started with surveys of have you been using these products? If you have, what have you been using? And have you told your doctors? You know, like they wanted a baseline of how many people were being open and honest. But they, a lot of them used apps. So they could send like, hey, we're going to be talking about this. So fill out this questionnaire on an app. And then they could bring all those answers already to their provider when they went for the clinical trial like enrollment. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of apps out there to help people figure out, um, to answer some of those questions and also to track their symptoms. So they would give them a product rather than take a product and then log your symptoms every day. How much did you take? When did you take it? What kind of symptoms did you have? Uh, what kind of solution did you have? Like, what kind of resolution of those? And then what side effects? And they could just plug it every day into an app on the phone. I think the issue might be a little bit of the self-selecting, where you know, people who are a little more paranoid who are not going to want to tell you anything or write anything down. Yeah. 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 Paranoid right, because of how much cannabis are <laughs> Are you aware of a lot of guides in the guiding psilocybin sessions, albeit on the QT? Or is <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> so good. Next. Glad they are. <laughs> Are there, are there any other barriers that you folks would see to, um, you know, cataloging catalog this kind of information or asking these questions and questions? So we are getting most everybody down that. All right, all right, we're moving. Yeah. Um, 